episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show with another really fascinating guest, uh, helping to create a better tomorrow. Uh, on today's episode, uh, we have the honor of being joined by Dr. Melissa Flagg, who is a senior fellow at the Center for Security and Emerging Technology and an adjunct professor in the Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service Center for Security Studies at Georgetown University. Uh, previously, Dr. Flagg served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Research, uh, responsible for policy and oversight, the Defense Department science and technology programs, including basic research through advanced technology development and the DOD Laboratory Enterprise. Uh, prior to that, Dr. Flagg worked in a range of public and private sector roles, including uh, the United States Department of State, the Office of Naval Research, the Office of Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, uh, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, and the Army Research Laboratories. Uh, she also ran her own consulting business, Flagg Consulting Services, and served the Chief Technology Officer for a company called Pocket T. Uh, and she, Dr. Flagg has served on numerous boards, including the National Academy of Sciences Air Force Study Board, uh, the Department of Commerce and Gen Emerging Technology Research Advisory Committee. Uh, she's on the board of Humanity 2050 and a full trustee with the DC chapter of the Awesome Foundation. Uh, she holds a PhD in pharmaceutical chemistry and a bachelor of science in pharmacy uh, from the University of Arizona and University of Mississippi, uh, respectively. Uh, Dr. Melissa Flagg, thanks for taking the time to come on the show today. Thanks so much. It's great to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you. Um, I, I'm really excited. And, you know, I uh, you know, typically love to start uh, off the show by handing our guests the floor for a little bit to, uh, to talk about their journey. But, you know, equally exciting to me, because I am also <laughs> have a background in pharmacy, I would love to hear about your journey from pharmacist to national security thought leader. And, uh, you know, what got you out of the local retail pharmacy and deciding to save the world <laughs> this matter. Yeah, well, uh, it definitely wasn't a straight line. <laughs> um, you know, I grew up in a really rural part of Missouri, Southeast Missouri, and my parents were a uh, teacher and uh, agricultural. Uh, my dad was a farmer, but he also made farm loans. So when you think about the jobs you know about when you're a kid, right, it was sort of like I could be a doctor or a nurse or a, a lawyer or a teacher um, or a pharmacist. And my dad was really pushing me to engineering. And I was like, uh, I'm just not up for that much calculus at that point in my life. So I wound up going to college at Ole Miss, uh, Hadi Tadi, for those of you who have ever been to uh, Oxford, Mississippi, because I had a full scholarship and I just wasn't up for debt at the time. And so I found myself getting a pharmacy degree and I'm actually working in a local pharmacy, uh, getting some practical hours. And the pharmacist actually said to me, you know, you should really go to grad school. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I don't have a great bedside manner with uh, sick people and dealing with insurance companies. So I actually was working in a laboratory in the evenings at the time, and a professor was doing ice diving in Antarctica, collecting sponges to look for anti-tumor compounds. And I was just so inspired. And so I wound up getting my PhD in natural products chemistry out in Arizona, um, where I banged around the Atacama Desert of Chile, collecting plants and these really strange little enclaves in the mountains where the clouds are captured and plants grow. And I thought I was gonna cure tuberculosis. And for those of you who are of a certain age, you'll remember Sean Connery and Medicine Man. Yeah. And uh, I just knew that was gonna be me. Yeah. But you know, life takes funny turns. And um, I wound up after some sort of zigs and zags through my postdoc doing a AAAS fellowship at the State Department. So I was a science and technology policy fellow. So it's September of 2001, and I arrive in Washington, and I'm going to work on sustainable development in Africa, and I'm going to save the world yet again. I was all up for saving the world for most of the first 30 years of my life. And then 9-11 happened, mm -hmm. and literally the city blew up. Um, people weren't focused on sustainable development anymore. 
And I was suddenly being asked by my bosses at the State Department to focus on a lot of issues that may sound very familiar to many of you today, uh, concerns about foreign scientists entering the country, concerns about research security issues, um, and I spent a lot of my time arguing with people in the intelligence community and the military about you can't just close the doors on science, that this is critical for um, how we generate ideas and actually how we've been a success as a nation. And so um, fast forward a couple of years and I had helped a guy who worked for the Office of Naval Research over in London open up some collaborations that he was interested in in the Baltics uh, just by making a few phone calls to the embassies, et cetera, because I was at the State Department. So he gives me a call in 2003 and says, hey, have you ever thought about working for the Navy? And I was like, um, never really thought about it. And he's like, well, <laughs> free rent in London. And I was like, I've always wanted to work for the Navy. <laughs> yeah. So I literally go... Um, sort of fly to London in January of 2004. I've never met uh, most of the people I'm going to work with. I don't really have a clear job description. Um, and I, it's just trial by fire. And the Navy was such an incredible family, such an incredible place to work. Um, they gave me such a clear sense of mission of being a part of something bigger than myself. When they realized how little experience I had with the military, they sent me out for five days on a scientist to see um, program where I literally was on this amphib on a ship um, watching flight deck operations getting certified and watching them do unreps. So like underway fuel replenishments and watching them flood the well deck. Um, and it was this incredible moment where I saw, I experienced, I was standing there talking to real sailors who were about to be shipped out to the Gulf because this was 2004 and the world was a very different place. It was very tangible that like, these are people that need to have the capability to go out and execute the mission that the United States has given them. Um, whether you agree with it or not, uh, they, didn't, they didn't choose the mission they signed up to serve. And it felt very okay uh, and actually very, very good to be focused on bringing them home alive, um, giving them the ability to go out, execute their mission and come home in one piece. And when we can't bring them home in one piece to do our best to uh, repair them and to get them back to real lives. And so I just had the Kool-Aid. The Navy was such an incredible place to start a career. So I was there for about six years, both in London and back in DC. And then I sort of wandered my way through the Pentagon, uh, took a little time off from government out in philanthropy and really focused on positive aspects of science. The Genius Grants program at the MacArthur Foundation was like this island in my life, like this little uh, sabbatical vacation where all I was focused on was what was best and good and most creative and most beautiful in the US. Um, and that really kind of re-energized my batteries after a lot of years of reading uh, scary intelligence reports. Um, as I really thought I was never going back to government. And suddenly one day I was given the opportunity to go back as a political appointee to be the DASD for research. And it's very hard to turn that down okay. when you're asked to serve again. And it was exciting and really fulfilling. And I felt like I was able to bring both a real respect for the civilians, um, for the sort of internal military research, but also an understanding of like, what's the real state of the art outside. So it was, it was incredibly fulfilling and a lot of fun. Uh, I, I spent some time after that, obviously, opening up an office for the Army, doing a little bit of time out on my own. And over the last couple of years, um, maybe 18 months or so, I've been at the Center for Security and Emerging Technology, which has been incredibly fun and has taken me back to a job I did in 2009, where we were really thinking about technology forecasting. How do we really think about emerging technologies and look at that horizon and bring more tangible uh, knowledge and understanding of that environment back to decision makers as we think about where we place our money and how we uh, think about strategic goals and in, in technology investment. And so there's been a lot of progress in the intervening kind of 12 years on data and data analysis and our ability to really understand that landscape. And CSET has really given me that opportunity to dive back in and uh, 
think more deeply about both what I what I've always wanted to do is kind of forecast an emerging technology, but to also layer on top of that a lot of experience as a decision maker that needed that information. What an exciting journey! I really, I'm a, I'm sitting here just like <laughs> it's it, it can make a movie out of your life. Just, uh, <laughs> just, just to do that. I I always tell people like always ignore adults that tell you you need to know what you're going to be when you're 14 because I'm 48 and I'm not sure that I'm not going to have a another act yet to come that is completely and totally different than anything I've done before so <laughs> I'm sure you will I'm sure you will <laughs> so uh, Melissa the you know you're at the the center for uh, security and emerging technologies it, it's located at uh, Georgetown's uh, School of Foreign Service, sort of defined as a, a think tank dedicated to policy analysis, the intersection of national and international security, emerging technologies. And then, you know, you, uh, you sort of drill down from that, focusing on the effects of uh, progress in artificial intelligence, advanced computing, biotech, a lot of really interesting themes. Talk, if you would, just a little bit about um, CSET in general, sort of the background, how it got set up. And then, you know, one of the things, you know, I'm joking, I'm not really jokingly, but sort of on a, on a given day, when I, when I look at someone in a position like you, um, how do you decide whether it's artificial intelligence or, bio, how do you decide what to work on in any given day? Is there, you know, I, I think of that scene in, you know, a lot of the movies where, you know, someone puts a big stack of papers on your desk, say, hey, the secretary wants an answer by five, you know, <laughs> review this. Um, how do you decide what you do on, on any given day at CSET? Well, that's that's a great question. Um, so I will punt a little bit by telling you about CSET first while I think about that second answer. <laughs> so, the center, so CSET, what I love about CSET is that I think there are two aspects of that organization that are unique from or sort of have it stand out from other think tanks in town, of which there are many good ones that I uh, have a great respect for. One of the aspects of CSET that's so unusual is that it is a fully funded think tank through a philanthropic funding. Okay. They, we take no money from the government and no money from industry. Okay. And that means when we work on a problem, we're not beholden to a sponsor. Um, we make all of our analyses public. Uh, we work on open source data. We are not trying to answer a specific question to a sponsor in private. We are trying to make sure that we are independent of perhaps something that might make them uncomfortable, a reality that might not be um, the, what they would like to see, uh, but really trying to do an analysis of the most important questions, but to make that analysis as independent as possible. This is really inspired by the RAND of the 1950s, where you hired a lot of young folks to come in to really inspire them to want to be in service of something bigger and to work on important and valuable problems, but to not be constrained by the here and the now and the demand signals of tomorrow or the next 24 or 48 hours, right? Um, so that's one aspect of CSEP that I think really is unusual, especially in Washington. And the second aspect is it, is a, it has a tremendous investment in data. So not only different types of data, whether it's scientific literature or investment data or alt metrics or patents or uh, surveys, we have a survey specialist so we could create our own surveys and draw in data that way. Uh, and that, that's certainly not an exhaustive list, but you get the point, but also the ability to actually have uh, the, the capacity and the capability of software engineers and data scientists to architect and, and curate that data so that you can really ask questions of it in meaningful ways. We have uh, the Chinese scientific literature, the CNKI database that we leverage. So we have quite a few native uh, speakers and readers. We also have translation services, both internally to CSET as well as contracted out. 
So we can also interrogate that data in native language. Uh, we also have some native Russian speakers and, and some other languages as well. So this ability to really anchor uh, questions on a foundation of data is something that really makes my soul sing. <laughs> I, I don't believe that data is the answer, right? Data is an input and it gives you perspective, but it's nice to have your intuition and your opinions and your educated sort of viewpoints on a topic challenged by, yeah, but the data says this. So for me, as a quote unquote expert in emerging technology and national security, there are so many moments when I'm interrogating the data and I feel like, wow, I didn't expect that. Like I thought the world looked like this. I was taught that the world looks like this. Uh, the anecdotal experience that I have told me the world looked like this, and yet the data is suggesting that's not true. So I need to step back and make sure that I'm not just spouting opinions that maybe were true 20 years ago, but are no longer true. But I also need to make sure that I'm not taking a single data source mm -hmm. And assuming that that is a true picture of the entire world. Right. So what I love about CSAT is this really deep foundation of data and the actual data scientists and research analysts that can help make that usable, mm -hmm. but then hand it to a group of people who are folks with degrees in political science and international relations and law and chemistry or you know, other top physics. And all of us being able to bring together a diverse experience, both of education and work, work experience with that data, I do feel like that's pretty unusual for a lot of the think tanks in town. Really cool. Um, Melissa, you, you've written a, a variety of reports at CSET uh, on, on some of these topics that you're, you're referring to. And I thought it would be fun just to dive into a couple of them to sort of give the audience uh, the perspective on, on, on really the, uh, the, the complex issues you're dealing with in terms of defending the, the R&D ecosystem. Um, you know, one of these reports is entitled A New Institutional Approach to Research Security in the United States, Defending a Diverse R&D Ecosystem, where, you know, you point out sort of this tremendous amount of, uh, of R&D uh, that is done outside of the government, now funded by, but outside of the government and labs and, and other institutes all around the United States. Uh, and it's not like, you know, uh, 30 years ago, there's only a few places that, you know, build nuclear bombs or whatever, but here, you know, artificial intelligence and biotech, you know, thousands of labs. And you propose this uh, interesting model of a clearinghouse, security clearinghouse to oversee a lot of this, to make sure that our adversaries aren't grabbing this stuff away. Uh, talk a little bit about this, sort of this paper and a little bit about this model of, of the security clearinghouse, if you would. So I think the the first thing I'll say really draws from a, a paper that I wrote just before that, which is thinking about what the R&D framework and ecosystem of the United States really is. Mm -hmm. And I think some of the foundational statistics that I'll throw out is that 78% of research and development that is funded in the United States is not funded by the government. So we're literally at less than a quarter of American R&D is federally funded. Mm. When you look at basic science, that's around 50% or a little bit less is federally funded. That's, that's a radical change since the 70s when we were at almost 70% of American R&D was federally funded and basic science was at almost 100%. So the world has changed dramatically since the period when we created our structures, organizations, and policies to manage American R&D. What has also changed dramatically is that, especially uh, when you think about national security and the military, we're now minority customers of technologies developed in industries, so they have no dependence on us. These yep. industries have no reason to service a military that's not gonna buy very much from them mm. and is likely to impose a significant number of restrictions. So 
the thing that I think is really important about this when you start to think about research security is the federal government still treats most of these problems like they're in charge, right? I, like I still fund 70% of American R&D and like I'm still a primary or major customer of the entire high-tech industry in America. So in the 70s, this worked. I'm the chairman of the board. You do as you're told, right? Or I'm a slightly in a slightly more autocratic position of being the most powerful person in the room with the largest checkbook. But if you fast forward to today, that isn't true. And yet, if you so if you want to protect an ecosystem that you are not in control of, mm -hmm. how do you do that? You probably don't do it by focusing solely on punitive approaches and arrests of people who don't fill out your forms for federal funding correctly. Yeah. That's policing the 22% that you fund. Yeah. And it's also drive, it's it's also incentivizing people who have a choice to take other funding to really consider, should I take federal funding or not? Or should I take this funding from Toyota or, or you know, uh, Ford or Google or something else or the MacArthur Foundation, right? I'm just mm -hmm. making stuff up now. But there are a lot of choices now for really high performing researchers. Maybe not for everyone, but especially for the top tier, there's quite a diverse set of choices. So if we really want to protect the ecosystem, in my opinion, you've got to bring people together where the government is a seat at the table, but they're not in charge. So this idea is really about creating an, an independent entity that really does some engagement with industry, with different sectors, different industry alliances, with different academic alliances and universities, with philanthropies, and talks about what are your concerns? What are the actual problems you have with IP theft? What are the actual challenges with managing some of these concerns the government has? Um, what types of bad behavior do you actually see? What types of patterns would you like to be seeing from other institutions like you, right? So the first thing is really to understand what are the range of problems that people have as opposed to deciding from Washington, we know best, we're gonna tell you how to protect this. When you haven't actually heard what the problems are on the ground by the people who actually fund and perform the vast majority of R&D in your country. I think lots of this also just helps you develop risk assessment frameworks that are very decision oriented rather than nationality oriented or some of these other approaches that are very tricky and likely to lack nuance and are probably at the end of the day difficult to enforce over the long term and unlikely to solve your problem because risk really is about how much exposure are you giving and to whom and to what as opposed to just like you're a scary person i mean right so i do feel like we we need to really begin to think about nuance about risk frameworks about open source data about access to tracking bad behavior if somebody's doing something at one university and they shut it down and they just go on to another university and another university and do the same thing wouldn't it be nice for those universities to know that without it being some something that starts to put them at risk. Mm -hmm. What we don't want this to be is everything through the punitive lens. We wanna actually give people the opportunity to start to create frameworks that allow them to buy into securing America and American R&D, not to be treated like they're the bad guy when they're the source of it, when they are American R&D. Uh, and so I feel quite strongly about this idea that we have to embrace this larger set of actors that really make up the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And that requires the federal government to go through a, a kind of identity crisis um, and a little bit of a mind shift of their role in that ecosystem. And, and 
continuing along that and, and sort of, you know, you, you talk about risk, but then, the, you know, you also write about um, the benefits and, you know, you, um, you've written policy briefs on sort of new frameworks for innovation uh, in American R&D. And I've been, you know, I've, I've had the opportunity on this show and in a previous platform to, to spend time with uh, some of these folks, and, you know, in terms of ONR and DARPA and some of these really interesting models that we don't see too much in the, in the private sector. We're beginning to, um, you know, the Welcome Trust is trying to do something now where they're emulating DARPA. Um, you know, President Biden talked about a sort of a health DARPA that uh, we need to create. Um, talk about some of your ideas in terms of, you know, some of your research in terms of what we need to be doing more of as a country in terms of spurring uh, more innovation, better innovation. So one of the things that I think the federal government is best at, and that for some reason it is least excited about doing, is to get out of the business of focusing so much on I want to be the program manager that 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 funds the coolest idea. Okay. And and I'm not saying there's not space for that. We need some of that. And actually we have organizations that are incredibly good at that and I think ONR and DARPA are two exceptional examples of that. Mm -hmm. They both happen to be aligned to a very highly mission-driven agency. Mm -hmm. And so they know why they are funding those big, crazy ideas. They're not done in a vacuum, right? Okay. But, but the most important thing, I believe, that we can do in the United States, if you actually want people to have those ideas, is to actually fund and invest in people and infrastructure that gives that gives the nation access to a pipeline of incredibly talented people that have choices. Right. There's a lot of money in this world. Is federal funding important? Yes. Is it the only source? No. But what do we actually need? We need a vibrant R&D ecosystem that helps improve the well-being of our citizens and drives the economy. We don't need to be focused on the federal government and industry fighting over whose money is better for scientists. What we know that industry will not fund is the foundational pipeline of getting educated people ready to hire. Mm -hmm. And so let's, let's talk about a few things that have come up at CSET. One, that there's a faculty shortage in AI. If you believe there's a faculty shortage in AI, and I will say I am agnostic to this because I haven't really seen the data yet. Um, but if you believe this, then, and you believe we need more American students to get PhDs in computer science and AI. So again, I'm agnostic to this because I think there is somewhat of a market uh, force mm -hmm. that plays. And if the more jobs you have and the higher paid they are, the more people get degrees in something. Uh, we see a lot of Americans getting undergrad degrees in computer science and they go to get jobs because 80% of the jobs that are AI related, they require a bachelor's degree, not a PhD. So how many PhDs do we need? Well, let's think about what does it take to get someone to want to have a, get a PhD? It takes inspirational teaching and access to people who are good at what they do, who love what they do and inspire you to want to have that life, right? So we don't pay teachers. We allow researchers to buy out of teaching when they get a federal grant from like the NSF or ONR or NIH. You're getting taught by tired graduate students who are not being paid a living wage or postdocs who are not being paid a living wage and being told to be postdocs for five to eight years sometimes after they get a PhD. Uh, adjunct professors are often getting paid one to $3,000 for a class for a semester. Um, so these are the people that are teaching students and there to inspire them. So if we really want more students to get PhDs in STEM, why don't we invest in curriculum? Why don't we invest in people who are passionate teachers? Why don't we invest in people who know the pedagogy? Why don't we have that curriculum in those online classes distributed for free across the country because they've been funded by the government? Why don't we allow them to have to tutors that sit at all of these institutions and help people with these courses, but have access to the highest quality coursework possible. 
So first of all, we've got to pay teachers if we want to get kids to be inspired by what they're learning and move on to get higher education. Mm -hmm. If you believe you have a faculty shortage, is it that you're not getting enough research or is it that you're not getting enough teaching? If you separate these two things, you fund them differently and you fund two different types of people. Mm. If it's the research you're not getting, why not do matching grants with all of these other institutions that want to pay for AI research? Why don't you fund maybe individual people to have money rather than for proposals and institutions to have money so that those people can travel to wherever it is that's going to treat them the best? Because guess what? This feeds into, again, inspiring the next generation. You're happier. You have the infrastructure you need. And now let's go to infrastructure. We should be focusing so much of our R&D dollars, in my opinion, on giving people access to connectivity, to compute, mm -hmm. to the instrumentation they need, to roofs that don't leak over the $4 million piece of equipment they have. Um, Additionally, maybe opening up a lot of this infrastructure to the community, not just to researchers at the university. Someone told me recently, oh, well, the NSF is going to put this, you know, computing center somewhere in, and I'm making this up now, Kansas. I don't know. Some, I'm in Missouri right now. It's some, some state near me. And I said, yeah, but is an entrepreneur in Kansas going to be able to use that computing center? N no. Is a school teacher at a high school that's underserved going to be able to use that compute center? No. It's going to be a bunch of people with federal grants who are going to have to buy time, mm. and they're going to be deprioritized behind the PI that wrote the grant that got funded. Mm. So what does that do for Kansas? So my, my feeling is that I love this idea that science is so cutting edge and exciting and that we want to fund these really exciting ideas. But I worry that we're all competing, industry, philanthropy, the federal government, the state governments, we're all competing to fund an idea that we can take credit for of like, mm. I funded this cool idea. <laughs> and we've, we just stopped. It's like we built a house on this incredible foundation of the 70s. And We've let it all go to ruin. We've stopped focusing on the foundations. We've stopped funding professors to have actual salaries. We've stopped paying grad students and postdocs to have a living wage. We've expanded how long it takes to get a PhD from three years to six or seven years. We've expanded a postdoc from one or two years to five or six years. We have made it virtually impossible to get a, a professorship, right? We've we've just we've stopped funding infrastructure programs. One of the great programs that's left is Durup in the Department of Defense, the Defense University uh, Research Infrastructure or Research Instrumentation Program. I think is what it's uh, and it's a loved program because you can actually buy equipment with that grant, and it's very rare to be able to do that with a grant. But we're up on the roof, fixing the roof. Like the foundation is rotting. There's holes in the floor. The walls are falling down. But we're up there on the roof, and we're we're fixing that roof, and it's beautiful because we're gonna get a we're gonna fund another quantum project. <laughs> so I I love it, and yet I think we've really forgotten about like funding the inputs to the ecosystem, yep. and we're funding things that we can count like papers and prizes. We're not, we're not thinking about the inputs and the outcomes, which is if I'm going to fight a war, if I'm the military and I'm going to fight a war, I don't go to war with 22% of my army. Right. I take it all. Well, then we need to get back to basics and realize they need to be clothed and fed and equipped and trained. The military knows that. The rest of us have forgotten. Mm. Really, really eye-opening. But uh, <laughs> I'm not always popular. Sorry, Ira. <laughs> no, no. It's uh, I, I I like hearing it from experts like you. you know, it, 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 it's it's a wake up call that uh, of where we need to be going. So it's it, it's it's really fascinating hearing you talking about this. Um, listen, what you know? I'm I'm a 
a child of the, the late 60s, early 70s. I grew up through the second part of the Cold War and the and nuclear arms race and so forth. And there you had a, a, a race that was limited by obviously they only make the nuclear bomb so big and, and so forth. Um, when it gets into uh, some of these topics that we get into on the show, the artificial intelligence, autonomous weapons, uh, quantum, as you mentioned, the race is a little different. Um, you don't really see the end of the race. You know? it, it's kind of a fluid thing. Um, what concerns you most in the position that you currently hold when you look at some of these topics and, and, and you know, you, you've, once again, you publish reports at CSET in terms of, you know, looking at AI hubs and, and once again, thinking about how we curve China's influence or, you know, what, what, what has you concerned in 2021? What are the, the topics that you would really like to see some resolution to in terms of our race, uh, whether it's with China or Russia or whoever it may be with, with some of these newer, cheaper technologies that a lot of people are playing around with? So I think this is, there's kind of two questions in there, at least from my perspective. And the first one is really, is this framing of a race really useful? Okay. So I think my first biggest concern at the moment is that we don't know what it is we want. We don't know what the strategic goal is. And so if it's going to be a race, there's a finish line. You know, like when I do this faster than the other person or better than the other person or whatever, mm -hmm. I win, right? Uh, if all you're saying is I need to have better metrics, I need to have more research publications and more scientists and more data and you're just picking all these metrics that are just things you can count and you're not saying okay my goal is the well-being of my citizens um so that means i need to protect my i need to like protect us from wars that would come to america right so i need to think about i need to think about security i need to think about you know i really don't want to get into a nuclear war. I mean, these are things that people actually really don't want to happen, right? right? I don't want a nuclear bomb to drop on the middle of the country. I don't want a biological weapon to be released in the country, etc. So I think there are these like very tangible security issues. But then I think there's also this kind of more general idea of foreign policy has become so divorced from domestic policy mm -hmm. and has so much power in Washington and so much power at the National Security Council that it's often framed in terms of, of winning in some esoteric metric-based way that's completely divorced from but we're here to secure the nation. Like that's what national security is. We're not here to make a bigger military. The military exists to secure the nation. And if I secure the nation, that means I'm securing their values, the, the sort of well-being of those citizens, their ability to live their lives in a free and, and relatively open and respectful way with one another, right? Mm -hmm. But that is a conversation that is non-existent in Washington. Mm. Everything is about, I need to be faster, better, more than fill in the blank. China, Russia, right? I need to go back to the Cold War because that's a framework I understand. I need an enemy. I really worry about this because it drives us to spending money on things that don't necessarily align to making America safer or a better place to live, it, it, that don't align to an improved well-being of our citizens. If we took the entire discretionary budget of, of the United States and put it into the military, would that be enough? Would it be, would it be enough? Would you not need anything else? Is it okay to do that at the expense of schools and roads and uh, hospitals and everything else that go into like the lives of our citizens? Mm -hmm. So I think that foreign policy wonks and national security wonks should be beholden to domestic policy much more than they are. 
Um, and I, I think that they should have strategic goals that are clearly aligned, that are contextualized for how they serve the country that pays them. I know this is not a popular point of view, and it is certainly not a 1979 point of view, then I don't really care. Um, I feel strongly that this is an absence. I think it's driving incredibly negative behaviors into our technology portfolios, which is we're just going to pour money into one area because we're all liquored up on it and worried about it. We're not stepping back and thinking, if I advance this field, does it actually help the strategic outcomes of the United States more or does it help my adversaries as much or more? Uh, I think that that's uh, a colleague of mine, Rita Konaev, who's an incredibly interesting woman, um, a Russian Israeli who did a postdoc at West Point and has done some really great social science research, actually wrote a paper on this that looks at the strategic frameworks from the military of some topics like um, lethality and survivability and deterrence and then map some of these technology areas to them and starts to think about, does this actually help if progress in this area is made, who does it help the most? Because most of these areas are so diffused across the world that it's virtually impossible to believe you're gonna be, you're gonna be able to contain it only in America. I think there's one other comment I'll make on this is that as I, I talked to you about the domestic change from the 70s to now, but the global change is fascinating as well, right? Because back in the 70s, we were also around two thirds or more than two thirds of the global R&D. But today we're at around 25% or less. That's not because we're doing less. It's because we, we were a model and the rest of the world was sure. like, we wanna get on board. So in 2000, the global R&D investment in total was around 890 billion. Today, that's up over 2.2 trillion and by some estimates, 2.4 trillion. So the United States is a quarter of that. It's just that, and so is China, but the rest of the world is 50%. There's $1.1 trillion of research out there that's not accounted for when we talk about the US and China. Amazing. So this idea that something is unique to China or unique to the United States or unique to Germany or Russia or South Korea or Japan or India is crazy. There are so many scientists in the world now. There are an order of magnitude, if not two orders of magnitude more than we had in 1950, right? Mm -hmm. There are, is, is so much instrumentation in the world. There's so much access to compute and to knowledge and curriculum. There's so much money floating around to fund R&D. So this idea that we're gonna do something that's hugely unique and we're gonna hide it in a box and we're gonna develop it all the way to something that wins a race that we have no finish line for, that we have no defined outcomes for, seems crazy. <laughs> but I've been called the crazy one, so that's cool. I will say one of the things that I get most excited about is this convergence of quantum and AI, because I think it's going to give us the ability to solve all kinds of really cool optimization problems that are just good for the world, right? I think there's gonna be so much ability to really understand hairy logistics problems, um, really weird, protein, you know, problems in medicine, uh, just like, I feel like there's so much interesting opportunity here at that convergence that marries like classical compute and quantum mm -hmm. with expanding the frontiers of artificial intelligence. But for me, this is, this is, this should be aligned to much less of like beating China or winning a race mm -hmm. and should be much more aligned to how does this make the lives of our citizens better? Why should they want to pay for this? Exactly. Well, listen, talk, um, I, I, you know, you, you, we talk about uh, everything you're doing at CSET so far, but you, you're involved in a lot of other things. Um, could you take us uh, for a couple of minute walk through both Humanity 2050 and the Awesome Foundation? Because, you know, I was looking at their websites and, there's a bunch of really cool stuff there in terms of climate engineering and 
making the universe awesome? <laughs> what are you doing with all that? I, I, that when you're done with the earth, <laughs> what are you doing with the universe? Yeah, so I always find that um, finding interesting people who are intellectually curious is a journey, right? You have to go out and work to find people who can open new little doors in your mind and think, ah, I had never thought about it or I've just never looked at the world that way. So uh, Humanity 2050 is really the brainchild of Carl Pabo. He was one of the um, one of the inventors of zinc finger, uh, what is it? Finger nuclease yep. or nuclease, finger lace, sure. right? That was the precursor to CRISPR Cas9, et cetera, yep. et cetera. And a, just a brilliant guy who really is focused on the fact that the world has become so complex and that the human mind doesn't actually process massive complexity and ambiguity very easily. And so trying to think about how we can take kind of massive, potentially catastrophic challenges and decompose them in ways that we can tolerate and kind of deal with the complexity in front of us in more rational ways. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I find that I often I don't necessarily kind of agree with everything, right? But I love the process of being surrounded by people who are actually thinking about how we think. Mm. Um, because that really, I feel like it gives me more self-awareness about my own thought processes, gives me more self-awareness about where I may be shortcut sure. on certain ideas or concepts because of the complexity, where I'm trying to fill in gaps because the uncertainty makes me uncomfortable, but that gap really shouldn't be filled in. Um, so I really appreciate the approach that Humanity 2050 has really because it's founded not so much on the problems that they apply it to, but on the idea of how human thought in periods of increasing complexity and ambiguity functions. So I find that very exciting. Um, I've actually shifted from being on the board to being on the advisory board now, uh, but I, I still, they're still all good friends and I still uh, meet with them regularly. I, the Awesome Foundation is something that actually I've moved to Missouri, so I'm no longer in D.C., so I'm actually I'm no longer participating in that. They don't have an Awesome Foundation where I'm living now, but it's this, but I love it. It's amazing, and you won't find that I'm living in Columbia, Missouri anywhere online because it's, it's not online. <laughs> I moved here during the pandemic for a lot of personal reasons. I'm from Missouri originally, um, but... The Awesome Foundation is this group of just organic, self-organized uh, groups of individuals who come together to do sort of micro-philanthropy in their communities. Mm. And they essentially have different processes for taking in applications for the community. I think the similarities are that they're very, they're very short. They're usually a page or two. And it's, it's not about like scale. It's about what what are you doing? What idea do you have that you could do where a thousand dollars would make a significant difference? Mm. It could be everything from a pilot for some new kind of local health care to planting wildflowers in a, like an area of the city that's not being taken care of. Or it could be a program to offer up a skate rink access to kids that can't afford it. Mm -hmm. it it's, it's very broad and it's all about just like, how awesome is it? Like, what awesome idea do you have? I get it. And it can be anything. It can be art, science, health, literacy, or just making the community more awesome. We're going to go dance on the street corner. Like the ideas are endless that we, that we see. And I love the awesome foundation for the fact that it really brings back to the community, um, that there's value in joy and in happiness and in awesomeness. Everything doesn't have to be through this puritanical lens of worth. Really, really it's fun. super awesome. Wherever you are, check out your, your area, see if there's an awesome foundation, get involved. They're amazing. There, there's one here in Philly, actually. I'm, I'm going to uh, check it out right afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Time for the, um, the fantasy question of the, of the uh, show. So um, 
it's a couple of now years in the future and, and you have solved uh, world peace and, and, and all, all the issues you're working on at CSET. Uh, I've come into a tremendous amount of a trillion dollars sitting here and I'm gonna set up the Melissa Flag uh, Center for Natural Products Pharmaceutical Chemistry. Um, and I offer you a ridiculous salary so you can't say no. <laughs> We're gonna go off and work in natural products. I love natural products, I gotta tell you. I love natural products research. I was involved in it for many years. Um, when you're not thinking, seriously, when you're not thinking of all national security stuff and AI and, and quantum and all this stuff, I, I know you think about natural products every once in a while because we got your start. Um, what, what, what type of stuff would you research today? I mean, the natural world holds so much potential for us. We've only explored just like, you know, as you were, <laughs> we only explored a very small percent of the biodiversity on this planet. Uh, when you think about natural products nowadays, uh, you're thinking, about, you know, if I was doing that again, I would do X, Y, and Z. Where are you going? Yeah, I, I love this question. So when I was a grad student, there was um, something that made me incredibly frustrated. And it's a big reason why I left research, really. I left the bench. And that was that even though we know that a plant holds hundreds or thousands of chemicals mm -hmm. and that they do this for a reason, they expend energy that is valuable, right? To produce this chemical profile in order to protect themselves as a general rule from being destroyed and going on to produce flowers and fruits and seeds so that they can reproduce and survive. And so, the idea that, that we're going to purify a single compound out of that plant and use it instead of thinking about the profile of 500 compounds as valuable, even though we know in nature that you wouldn't evolve to continue producing all of those compounds if they weren't needed for some reason, right? To me is insane. But we've decided that there's only one way that we allow scientific testing to happen. Science has become so narrow-minded in that we have a single way of testing pure compounds. We don't want all the variables of having multiple compounds. It's too hard to do controlled experiments on complex mixtures, so we don't do it. You can't patent a compound complex mixture from a plant, so who wants to do something you can't get rich off of, even if it saves humanity, that's not worth it. That doesn't make sense in a capitalistic system. And for me, this very obvious path for cheaply helping humans be healthier is essentially shut down by science, which I love. I love science. I don't love that they've shut this down. So if I had endless amounts of money, I think I would spend a lot of time trying to bring some of the smartest, um, smartest people, some of the biggest curmudgeons, some of, you know, young people who don't know any better, <laughs> old people who are willing to break the system. Uh, I think I would just bring together the most creative group of people I could. I would give them as much access to infrastructure, travel, um, access to countries where we could do partnerships. And I would ask them to think about what's another way to test complex mixtures? What's another way to provide validated, scientifically relevant um, knowledge on how we can use natural products to help people uh, to the community without going through shareholders in the pharmaceutical industry? How do I do that? There's, there, science doesn't allow this at the moment. There's only one way to test. That just can't possibly be true. And I, I like to tell the story of like, we have to remember that science is really just a framework for uncertainty. It's a framework for us to ask questions of an eminently unknowable universe. And the belief that science tells us truth is so antithetical to real science. So let's talk leeches. Back in the day, they used leeches. Seemed like a great idea. Fast forward, we were like, ooh, that's stupid. Leeches are bad. Then fast forward a little more and we're like, oh, hemochromatosis. Hmm, leeches. Leeches work for hemochromatosis. 
because still, if you have hemochromatosis, we basically just tell you, you have to go drop, get your blood drawn because you have too much iron building up and you just give blood. So were, were leeches good or were leeches bad? Well, that's not what science tells you. Science is an accumulation of data over time that helps you shift your hypothesis and ask a better, more relevant question the next time and to add more knowledge on top of that and to remember that you do not know the truth. You know what you know today. And to me, science at its best helps us remember how little we know, but gives us a framework for allowing that to not be scary. Mm. Gives us a framework to question it, to learn more, to understand what I do know, to feel better about that. When it becomes a religion, when it becomes truth, I get very concerned because then it limits how we question, what we question, and ultimately what we learn and who we inspire to come into this game of, of thinking about the universe. I really, and we'll talk more offline, but I really appreciate that answer. But I'll <laughs> leave it at that. Um, Melissa, final, um, final question, Eric, really handing you back the floor, obviously, you know, throughout your journey through uh, academia, through industry, through government, you've, you've met a, a wide range of fascinating people. Uh, take a couple of minutes, if you would, just to to mention a shout out to anyone that you want to that has been really important uh, as you've taken this journey uh, that you want to just uh, uh, that we haven't mentioned yet. Like, Absolutely. I have been so lucky. My life has been full of so many incredible humans who've given so much of their time and their passion and their intellect and their frustration and their corrective management <laughs> to me, all of which I appreciate deeply. The first person is really Alice Clark. She, she was my postdoc. She was a gra undergrad professor of mine um, and was my postdoc advisor. And I remember asking a question when I was an undergrad in class and she said, I don't know. She was my microbiology professor. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, I'm sorry. You know, ask a professor a question they don't know the answer to. <laughs> You're like, ah, oh, sorry. And I remember her saying, absolutely do not apologize. There are two possible reasons I don't know, or three, right? One, nobody knows the answer to that. <laughs> two, I just don't know the answer to that. Either way, this is exciting. If I don't know the answer, we should look it up and find it and we'll all know more. And if no one knows the answer, then that's why you should go to grad school. That's a dissertation topic. Yep. And I just remember feeling so inspired by that. And she's really stayed with me over the years and has been a mentor in so many moments of my life for reminding me that it's not about me. It's not personal. It's really about keeping your eye on the prize, that science is not something to get attached to, that science is supposed to give us this framework to open more doors, not to close them, not to make you apologetic, not to make you defensive. I really love her for that. Um, Norman Newrider speaks like eight languages, Russian, Polish, German, French, Spanish. I watched once watched him learn Portuguese on a plane and speak it in the airport when we landed in Brazil. The man has a had a PhD in petroleum chemistry from the 50s. He helped translate with the Russians uh, technical translations during the nuclear discussions in the Cold War. And he was my boss at the State Department. And he told me the most useful thing I ever learned, which was your job description is to always answer the phone, to never tell anybody that's not your job, and to always follow up on what you say you'll do, which means you spend a lot of time learning who does what other job because you're always trying to figure out, like, how do I follow through on helping this person you know, answer this question that isn't in my job jar. Because of that, within two years, I had learned so much about the Department of State and so much about diplomacy because he didn't let me only become an expert in the thing in front of me. He forced me to learn and appreciate the expertise of the people around me. Um, and I think the other person I'll mention, there are a lot of people, yeah. but the other person I'll mention is really, um, 
Admiral Bill Landay. He was the admiral who brought me back from London to the Office of Naval Research in DC and gave me the hardest, most impossible task I'd ever been given, which was be able to create a system that gives me global technology awareness. I want to know everything that's going on in science around the world at any given moment. And he started me on a career of just questioning emerging technology and learning about it and delving into new ways to understand it. And he, so he gave me an impossible task, but he also um, didn't leave me hanging, right? He gave me tools, he gave me resources, he gave me support, but he also just didn't help me that much. And he forced me to do it on my own. And so I guess those are the three people that I'll leave it at. There are a million more, but they're the ones who really fundamentally changed my life, I think. Wonderful. Yeah, it's uh, it's a fascinating journey, Melissa. I, I really, you know, once again, I, I, it's it's been so enjoyable listening to it, and I, you know, I look forward to watching uh, the coming years, and decades, and, and and what happens next because it's it's just a uh, a wonderful story. Um, it's it's been really great talking to you uh, and, and hearing about it um, for everybody that. Um, is going to be listening to this episode or watching on the podcast, I'm sorry, listening on the podcast or watching on the YouTube channel. Uh, you've been listening to Dr. Melissa Flagg, Senior Fellow at the Center for Security and Emerging Technology and Adjunct Professor in the Edmund A. Wall Walsh School of Foreign Service Center for Security Studies at Georgetown University. Uh, she's also on the Advisory Board of Humanity 2050 and I guess, soon to be setting up the awesome foundation chapter in Missouri somewhere. Uh, really, really wonderful stuff, Melissa. I want to, again, thank you for taking the time to come on the show. Uh, thank you, obviously, for everything you're doing for uh, the world, for national security here in the U.S. And as we say on our show, thank you for helping to, to create a better tomorrow through what you're doing. Really, really impressive. Thank you so much for having me.